My name is Professor Harold Ellis. Uh, I was Professor of Surgery for many years at the Old Westminster Hospital. I retired in 1989. I now teach anatomy. And I'm teaching here uh, in this dissecting room uh, on the Guy's campus in London. Now, in this demonstration, I'm going to cover the following topics. I'm going to talk about the thoracic cage, the bones of the chest wall. I'm going to talk about the mechanism of respiration, which will involve movements of the ribs, movements of the diaphragm, and the accessory muscles of respiration. We'll then move into the chest cavity, and I'm going to cover the pleura, and I'm going to cover the lungs. Right, we're going to dim the lights now so that we can look at some slides. Here we can see the bony skeleton of the thorax uh, from the front. We have the manubrium, the handle, the body of the sternum, and the ziphy sternum, or the ziphoid, joined together by cartilage. These are cartilage joints. As the subject gets older, about 40 years onwards, these joints often ossify. So you'll frequently see a specimen where the manubrium, body of the sternum, and the ziphoid is one solid bone. And here we have the, the 12 ribs. Uh, the first seven ribs are called the true ribs. They run along and they attach by cartilage directly to the sternum. Going to the lower end, the twelfth rib looks rather long in this specimen. Of course, they vary enormously. The twelfth rib can often be absolutely tiny. It varies. And the eleventh rib also is longer, but, but, uh, but again, much shorter than the others. The 11th and the 12th rib have no connection at all with the sternum, and they're called the, four, the floating ribs. They float. They end in a little tip of cartilage in the muscles of the abdominal wall. Ribs 8, 9, and 10 are given a very silly name, 8, 9, and 10, are given a very silly name. They're called the false ribs. There's nothing false about them at all. But what it means is that those ribs will, instead of articulating directly with the sternum, here we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Here, 8, 9, and 10, their cartilages join together and then join up with the seventh costal cartilage to reach the sternum. So I'm sorry to say that 8, 9 and 10 false ribs, silly name because there's nothing false about them at all. Now the sternum develops in the fetus in two bars of cartilage, the sternal bars, which then fuse together. And a number of centers appear in the cartilage to form the sternum itself. And that's of some interest because not rarely those two sternal bars of cartilage fail to fuse together. And then you get the not rare congenital anomaly, which I show you in this picture. The two bars have failed to fuse together, giving the condition of pectus excavatus or funnel chest. It occurs in perfectly normal, otherwise perfectly normal, healthy subjects. Of course, don't forget that we've also got the back of the chest to consider. So if we see here, we can see the ribs from behind, the two floating ribs here, not, not reaching the chest wall. And here we can see the back of the chest covered in its upper part by the scapula. When you're examining the patient, you need to know how to identify individual ribs for all sorts of purposes. The commonest thing that we do is you feel the suprasternal notch on your patient, run your finger down the manubrium until you hit this very prominent ridge here. 
the manubrio sternal junction, the angle of Louis. <clears throat> Slide your fingers to each to each one or other side, put one finger above and one finger below, and you are feeling the second rib. From there, you can count down progressively down the ribs. Why not start with the first rib? You'd think that's the logical thing to do. Well, the first rib, of course, is buried away if you feel yourself under your clavicle and you can't identify it. So you have to use the angle of Louis to find the second rib. Are there any other useful landmarks? Well, from the front, you run your finger down the side of the chest and you come to the subcostal margin here. Hmm? Can't go any further down than that. In the, in the mid-axillary line, you hit this, which is the tenth rib. The floating ribs are too far behind, you don't reach those. So you can identify the tenth rib on yourself. If you feel the tenth rib and then count upwards, you'll come to the angle of Louis and you'll get back to the second rib. All right then, when we're looking posteriorly, if you feel the spine of the scapula, which is very easy to feel on yourself, easier to feel on a colleague or on a patient, that is over the third rib. It's not a landmark that's often used, but a landmark that's very frequently used in clinical practice is to feel the lower pole of the scapula. That's easy to feel. And that covers the seventh rib. Lower pole of the scapula, seventh rib. Now that's useful in the operating theatre. The patient's lying on the operating table with his arm up like that, all covered over with towels. You can't reach the angle of Louis. You can't get down to the lower border of the chest wall, T10. But you can feel the lower pole of the scapula. And that very accurately is over the seventh rib, and you'll see the thoracic surgeon using that landmark to make his incision in the appropriate intercostal space.